Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we are going to discuss the summary, flat overview, analysis and themes of Wuthering Heights. We will also read some of the most powerful love dialogues of the novel. Let's read the summary and flat overview of the novel first. Themes in Wuthering Heights Theme is a pervasive idea presented in a literary piece. Themes in Wuthering Heights are masterpieces by Emily Bronte that apply to every era. Let's check some of the themes in Wuthering Heights. Good and Evil Good and Evil are the major theme of the novel. She has presented this trend through piety, love, revenge and obsession. Violence and Revenge Violence begets violence. The author tells the impacts of violence along with the theme of revenge. Through Heathcliff, the readers see the abuse he suffers. Hence, he abuses the other person. People become revengeful when they are ill-treated in their childhood. Heathcliff turns violent to everyone around him. Heathcliff first makes Hindley pay by making him homeless and then keeping Hareton secluded from the social world. Class differences. In the 18th and 19th centuries, it has been a popular strain in various stories where people born in one class usually stayed in the same or went insulted and humiliated. Edgar is rich because of his belonging to the rich class. His parents inherited him a property. On the contrary, Nelly Dean is poor at their service because of her class. Dominance of Patriarchy before the 20th century, most of the male heads were abusive towards children and women in the family. Knowledge and power are intertwined. It is shown through the abusive behavior of Heathcliff who forces Hatton to stay uneducated. He does so to keep the power to question his immoral authority. Solitude Many characters in the novel seem to enjoy loneliness. Even in the beginning, Heathcliff and Henley want to stay isolated instead of joining others. Lockwood also states that his desire for isolation has forced him to move to Thrushcross Grange. Self-knowledge Self-knowledge means the characters come to know about themselves or become conscious of their persona. When Catherine makes a decision to marry Edgar, she becomes fully aware that she is double-minded. Relationships the relationships shown between two families of Linton and Earnshaw are very strong. However, the love between Heathcliff and Catherine is confusing. Earnshaw's kindness towards him in the beginning shows his ability to forge relations even with an adopted children. Character Psychology The psychological issue, in a Fruden sense, shows distinct sides of Catherine, Heathcliff and Edgar. Heathcliff doesn't care about society but fulfills his desires. That is it. Catherine loves Heathcliff but she takes care of her status in society. That is ego. Edgar represents the moral framework of the society. That is super ego. A man named Lockwood rents a manor house called Thrushcross Grange in the isolated Moor country of England. He meets his landlord Heathcliff here. Heathcliff lives in an ancient manor of Wuthering Heights, four miles away from Grange. In this wild, stormy countryside, Lockwood asks his housekeeper, Nellie Dean, to tell him the story of Heathcliff and the strange denizens of Wuthering Heights. She agrees and starts the story. Nellie remembers her childhood. She works as a servant at Wuthering Heights for the owner of the manor, Mr. Anshaw, and his family. Mr. Earnshaw goes to Liverpool and returns home with an orphan boy, Heathcliff, whom he will raise with his own children. At first, the Earnshaw children, a boy named Hindley, and his younger sister, Catherine, detest the dark-skinned Heathcliff. But Catherine quickly comes to love him, and the two soon grow inseparable, spending their days playing on the moors. After his wife's death, Mr. Anshaw sends his son Hindley to school. Three years later, Mr. Anshaw dies and Hindley inherits Wuthering Heights. He returns with a wife, Frances, and immediately seeks revenge on Heathcliff. Once an orphan, later a pampered and favored son, Heathcliff now finds himself treated as a common laborer, forced to work in the fields. 
Heathcliff continues his close relationship with Catherine. However, one night they wander to Thresh Cross Grange, hoping to tease Edgar and Isabella Lenton, the cowardly, snobbish children who live there. Catherine is bitten by a dog and is forced to stay at the Grange to get back to health for five weeks, during which time Mrs. Lenton works to make her a proper young lady. By the time Catherine returns, she has become infatuated with Edgar and her relationship with Heathcliff grows more complicated. When Frances dies after giving birth to a baby boy named Harriton, Henley descends into the depths of alcoholism and behaves even more cruelly and abusively towards Heathcliff. Eventually, Catherine's desire for social advancement prompts her to become engaged to Edgar Linton. Despite her overpowering love for Heathcliff, Heathcliff runs away from Wuthering Heights, staying away for three years and returning shortly after Catherine and Edgar's marriage. When Heathcliff returns, he immediately sets about seeking revenge on all who have wronged him. Having come into a vast and mysterious wealth, he deviously lends money to the drunken Hindley, knowing that Hindley will increase his debts and fall into deeper despondency. When Hindley dies, Heathcliff inherits the manor. He also places himself in line to inherit Thrushcross Grange by marrying Isabella Linton, whom he treats very cruelly. Catherine becomes ill, gives birth to a daughter, and dies. Heathcliff begs her spirit to remain on earth. She may take whatever form she will. She may haunt him, drive him mad, just as long as she does not leave him alone. Shortly thereafter, Isabella flees to London and gives birth to Heathcliff's son, named Linton after her family. She keeps the boy with her there. Thirteen years pass during which Nellie Dean serves as Catherine's daughter's nursemaid at Thrushcross Grange. Young Catherine is beautiful and headstrong like her mother, but her temperament is modified by her father's gentler influence. Young Catherine grows up at the Grange with no knowledge of Wuthering Heights. One day, however, wandering through the moors, she discovers the manor, meets Harriton, and plays together with him. Soon afterwards, Isabella dies, and Linton comes to live with Heathcliff. Heathcliff treats his sickly, whining son even more cruelly than he treated the boy's mother. Three years later, Catherine meets Heathcliff on the moors and makes a visit to Wuthering Heights to meet Linton. She and Linton begin a secret romance conducted entirely through letters. When Nelly destroys Catherine's collections of letters, the girl begins sneaking out at night to spend time with her frail young lover who asks her to come back and nurse him back to health. However, it quickly becomes apparent that Linton is pursuing Catherine only because Heathcliff is forcing him to. Heathcliff hopes that if Catherine marries Linton, his legal claim upon Thrushcross Grange and his revenge upon Edgar Linton will be complete. One day, as Edgar Linton grows ill and nears death, Heathcliff lures Nellie and Catherine back to Wuthering Heights and holds them prisoner until Catherine marries Linton. Soon after the marriage, Edgar dies, and his death is quickly followed by the death of the sickly Linton. Heathcliff now controls both Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. He forces Catherine to live at Wuthering Heights and act as a common servant while he rents Thrushcross Grange to Lockwood. Nellie's story ends as she reaches the present. Lockwood, appalled, ends his tenancy at Thrushcross Grange and returns to London. However, six months later, he pays a visit to Nellie and learns of further developments in the story. Although Catherine originally mocked Harriton's ignorance and illiteracy in an act of retribution, Heathcliff ended Harriton's education after Henley died, Catherine grows to love Harriton as they live together at Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff becomes more and more obsessed with the memory of the elder Catherine to the extent that he begins speaking to her ghost. Everything he sees reminds him of her. Shortly after a night spent walking on the moors, Heathcliff dies. Harriton and young Catherine inherit Wuthering Heights in Thrushcross Grange, and they plan to be married on the ne next New Year's Day. After hearing the end of the story, Lockwood 
goes to visit the graves of Catherine and Heathcliff. Analysis of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights Wuthering Heights is constructed around a series of dialectic motifs that interconnect and unify the elements of setting, character, and plot. An examination of these motifs will give the reader the clearest insight into the central meaning of the novel. Although Wuthering Heights is a classic, as Frank Kerm has, has noted precisely because it is open to many different critical methods and conducive to many levels of interpretation, the novel grows from a coherent imaginative vision that underlies all the motives. That vision demonstrates that all human perceptions is limited and failed. The fullest approach to Emily Bronte's novel is through the basic patterns that support this vision. Wuthering Heights concern the interactions of two families, the Anshaws and Lintons, over three generations. The novel is set in the desolate moors of Yorkshire and covers the years from 1771 to 1803. The Earnshaws and Lintons are in harmony with their environment, but their lives are disrupted by an outsider and catalyst of change, the orphan Heathcliff. Heathcliff is first of all an emblem of the social problems of a nation entering the age of industrial expansion and urban growth. Although Bronte sets the action of the novel entirely within the locale familiar to her, she reminds the reader continually of the contrast between that world and the larger world outside. Aside from Heathcliff's background as a child of the streets and the description of urban Liverpool from which he is brought, the novel contains other reminders that Yorkshire long insulated from change and susceptible only to the forces of nature is no longer as remote as it once was. The servant Joseph's religious cant the class distinction obvious in the treatment of Nellie Dean as well as of Heathcliff and Lockwood's pseudo-sophisticated urban values are all reminders that Wuthering Heights cannot remain as it has been, that religious, social and economic change is rampant. Bronte clearly signifies in the courtship and marriage of young Cathy in Harriton that progress and enlightenment will come and the wilderness will be tamed. Heathcliff is both an embodiment of the force of this change and its victim. He brings about a change but cannot change himself. What he leaves behind, as Lockwood attests and the relationship of Cathy and Harriton verifies, is a new society, at peace with itself and its environment. It is not necessary, however, to examine in depth the Victorian context of Wuthering Heights to sense the dialectic contrast of environments. Within the limited setting that the novel itself describes, society is divided between two opposing worlds. Wuthering Heights, ancestral home of the Earnshaws, and Thrushcross Grange, the Linton Estate. Wuthering Heights is rustic and wild. It is open to the elements of nature and takes its name from atmospheric tumult. The house is strong, built with narrow windows and jutting cornerstones fortified to withstand the battering of external forces. It is identified with the outdoors and nature and with strong masculine values. Its appearance, both inside and out, is wild, untamed, disordered and hard. The Grange expresses a more civilized, controlled atmosphere. The house is neat and orderly, and there is always an abundance of light. To Bronte's mind, feminine values. It is not surprising that Lockwood is more comfortable at the Grange since he takes pleasure in feminine behavior, gossip, vanity of appearance, adherence to social decorum, romantic self-delusion, while Heathcliff, entirely masculine, is always out of place there. Indeed, all of the characters reflect to greater or lesser degrees the masculine and feminine values of the places they inhabit. Henley and Catherine Earnshaw are as wide and uncontrollable as the heights. Catherine claims even to prefer her home to the pleasure of heaven. Edgar and Isabella Linton are as refined and civilized as the Grange. 
the marriage of Edgar and Catherine, as well as the marriage of Isabella and Heathcliff, is ill-fated from the start not only because she does not love him, as her answer to Nelly Dean's catechism reveal, but also because both are so strongly associated with the values of their homes that they lack the opposing and necessary personality components. Catherine is too willful, wild and strong. She expresses too much of the masculine side of her personality, while Edgar is weak and effeminate. They are unable to interact fully with each other because they are not complete individuals themselves. This lack leads to their failure to perceive each other's true needs. Even Cathy's passionate cry for Heathcliff, Nelly, I'm Heathcliff, is less love for him as an individual than the deepest form of self-love. Cathy cannot exist without him, but a meaningful relationship is not possible because Cathy sees Heathcliff only as a reflection of herself. Heathcliff, too, has denied an important aspect of his personality, archetypically masculine. Heathcliff acts out only the aggressive, violent parts of himself. The settings and the characters are patterned against each other and explosions are the only possible results. Only Harriton and young Cathy, each of whom embodies the psychological characteristics of both Heights and Grange, can successfully sustain a mutual relationship. This dialectic structure extends into the roles of the narrators as well. The story is reflected through the words of Nellie Dean, an inmate of both houses, a participant in the events of the narrative and a confidant of the major characters, and Lockwood, an outsider who witnesses only the results of the characters' interactions. Nellie is a companion and servant in the Earnshaw and Linton households, and she shares many of the values and perceptions of the families. Lockwood, an urban sophisticate on retreat, misunderstands his own character as well as the characters of others. His brief romantic adventure in Bath and his awkwardness when he arrives at the Heights, he thinks Cathy will fall in love with him. He mistakes the dead rabbits for puppies, exemplify his obtuseness. His perceptions are always to be questioned. Occasionally, however, even a denizen of the conventional world may gain a glimpse of the forces at work beneath the surface of reality. Lockwood's dream of the dead Cathy, which sets off his curiosity and Heathcliff's final plan, is a reminder that even the placid, normal world may be disrupted by the psychic violence of a willful personality. The presentation of two family units and parallel brother-sister husband-wife relationships in each also emphasizes the dialectic. That two such opposing modes of behavior could arise in the same environment prevents the reader from easy condemnation of either pair. The use of flashback for the major part of the narration it begins in Midia's res reminds the reader that he or she is seeing events out of their natural order, recounted by two individuals whose reliability must be questioned. The working out of the plot over three generations further suggests that no one group can perceive the complexity of the human personality. Taken together, the setting, plot, characters, and structure combine into a whole when they are seen as parts of the dialectic nature of existence. In a world where opposing forces are continually arrayed against each other in the environment, in society, in families, and in relationships, as well as within the individual, there can be no easy route to perception of another human soul. Wuthering Heights convincingly demonstrates the complexity of this dialectic and portrays the limitations of human perception.